Section nine of the Desirable Alien at Home in Germany by Violet Hunt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter eight Blue Pates and Shoppen. I know a child who, when she was asked where she would like to be taken for a summer's holiday, chose to forego the spades and pails of Ramsgate and Cromer in favour of the Isle of Athelney, if island there be, because she wanted to find the hut where Alfred the Great burnt the cakes. I wanted to see Marburg, because I had read Kingsley's poem, and was interested in the pious lady whose husband would not let her be charitable. Meeting her with an apron full of loaves for the poor, he asked her what she was carrying, and God so willed it, that when she obediently opened the folds of her apron, flowers fell out of it, and justified her piety. And one evening in autumn, as our train glided softly and sweetly, as trains do glide in Germany, out of one valley into another, till we came into the valley of the Lahn, which is the river on which Marburg is built, I was thinking, in a desultory manner, of my childhood's desire, and the saintly figure of St. Elizabeth of Hungary. Presently the train just slid into Marburg, and we got out and passed out of the station through a flower-besprint waiting room and into a bus, and jogged along to our abiding place, under the imposing shadow of the Elisabethan Kirche. And all the while, I was thinking of Conrad of Marburg. I wanted to say that now, to my grown-up lights, the builder of the Elizabethan Kirche seemed an uncommonly silly woman, but I'm always afraid of offending Joseph Leopold's Catholic susceptibilities. So I switched off from medieval sentiment to the heroine of a modern extravaganza, which I suppose every English person has read. I was now domiciled in the German university town that corresponds more closely to Oxford than St. Bon, which to me suggests Cambridge. We all remember how Miss Zuleika Dobson, after having drowned the flower of Oxford in the Thames, calls for a Bradshaw and looks out a train for Cambridge, intending to do the same by the students of that university. But I do not think, with all respect to Max's heroine, that this would have come so easy. For though it might be urged by some Oxford fanatics that youth, subjected for a term or two to its romantic and unique charm, is still capable of drowning itself en masse for the love of a lady, I don't think anyone would put up the same plea for Cambridge. The backs are too Tennysonian, not savage or Byronic enough. Cambridge would think twice about it. But of one thing I am positive, that such an outrageous sex campaign as that waged by this young lady at the English University would have been absolutely impossible at either Bonn or Marburg. Certainly not at Marburg. Bonn is less savage, less rococo, more accessible to feminine wiles. The boys of Bonn, even with the national precedent of Werther before their eyes, would think not twice but a hundred times before making fools of themselves over a mere female, Marburg would not entertain the idea for a single moment. Yet Marburg is surely a more romantic place than Oxford. It is living. It has kept up its continuity with the past. There are not so many dreaming spires, but there are three very wide-awake churches. The castle at Oxford is an inconsiderable ruin. It is down there by the slums, a mere appanage or lean-to of the railway station, while the Schloss at Marburg is one thousand feet above the town, and in the very centre of things, dominating all the modern life of the place. The River Lahn is not so wide as the Thames, and there is no boating in particular to be had on it, but the boar comes down from his lair in the hills to drink of it, and the wild cat laughs in the woods that clothe its banks. Oh yes, it is far more romantic. For mere unconsidered peasant females there wear costume, 
the professor's daughters so haughty and advanced in ideas are kept plain much as they are anywhere it is a belief or used to be a standing grievance with eton masters ever since a young peer of seventeen ran away from thence with a mature english countess that they are ethically debarred from keeping a pretty daughter at home she is sent away on visits as much as possible if she is of the type that is likely to be upsetting it is quite immaterial to Max or Fritz at this period of their growth whether the daughters of their tutor are pretty or plain. These young ladies may, as far as he is concerned, continue to reside in their father's house and tread the sharp cobbles of marble with no fear of being followed and sleep sound of nights without any danger of being serenaded. Plain or coloured, Max or Fritz heeds her not to either her or his detriment. But Max and Fritz are not quiet, not at all. They have plenty of fun. But it is concerned with quite another goddess than Venus. They go in hordes to dine at some place in the woods, smoke and drink, and finally photographed with their arms around a goddess of sorts. She is covered and wreathed with flowers, but she is a beer barrel. This is probably a safe derivative of such emotions as the student can spare from his studies. He does not insist on a yearly carnival of sex such as May Week or Camim, and it is not in the least necessary that his bed maker should be old or ugly. No woman born, at least no woman born on German soil, could take him by storm, and even if Zuleika Dobson, that lovely exotic, with her pink pearl and her black pearl, her costumes and her engaging ways were to descend at the best hotel or come to stay with the professional uncle in the college, she would not, it is my belief, be able to extract a glance from the splendid students with the cropped heads and the scarred cheeks who sit day by day at their special stammtisch in the Ritter or the Krone. Much less could she persuade them to throw themselves into the slow and sluggish line for her sake? At least I think not. I am bitter, for I have never in my life met anything more impervious to feminine wiles than the German student. I could not get so much as a look of intelligence out of any one of them, of bored or annoyed intelligence even, although on the first night of my arrival I did a thing calculated to stir such a one to the depths a thing that made the waiters blench with awe and hastily to interpose to forbid the sacrilege. I made, as if to sit down, at the special table with the little bronze knight in armour standing in the middle of it, bearing a banner inscribed with the magic words, Stammtisch. Headwaiter Ernst warned me off just in time. Joseph Leopold was too slow. And a moment later, only a moment later, a stern, handsome man with a large head and a shaven crown advanced with fine deliberation. He had hung up his hat on a deer sandler in the little passage which led into the street and sternly bidden the great Dane who followed him in to lie down. Great Danes often lie down near me, but I had long realised it was as much as my place was worth to pat a student's dog. It is reserviert, Ernst informed me in a breathless whisper. He meant the Stammtisch, placed in the best and warmest corner of the Speisesaal, the least draughty and at the same time not too far from the window. It was the table that a newcomer would naturally turn to. A low seat runs round the corner and overhead there is a locker built into the wall with the arms of the corps whose students are pleased to dine here engraved on it. The door of the locker clicks as one student after another opens it with his key and abstracts papers from it or deposits the cap he is wearing, anything of which he wants to be rid of for a few minutes. A student can do as he likes. He is everything at Marburg. There is a tremendous suggestion of insolence about these German hobbledy-hoys, these Teutonic gawks. If indeed anything foreign can be gawky, 
I begin to think the term was invented only for the young of the English. At any rate, of their contemporaries at Oxford, a hostess has been known to say, when the question of her capabilities of entertaining them in the lump arose, oh, one just asks them all and knocks their heads together and sees what comes of it. Footnote. The fact is that there is much less difference between German university life and English university life, as far as the personnel is concerned, than between, let us say, Greenwich time and Central European time. I have myself extra professorially entertained the German undergraduates, and I have been confident of the woes of the German Don's wife at being called upon to entertain, towards the end of term time, large numbers of her husband's students. It is possible that the German student is a thought less snobbish than the English undergraduate, but it's hardly more than a thought. The German, like the Englishman, is very much given to little personal cliques, or to little personal studies that will monopolise the whole of his attention, and for a senior in any way to arouse his interest in other or more general topics is to knock at very closed doors. I have, for instance, the sort of commemoration dinner given by a German professor of history, tried to arouse some sort of interest in the spotty boy sitting next to me as to the elective theory, let us say, of the British crown, a subject one would say sufficiently interesting to anyone professing history as the occupation of a lifetime. But this youth was interested solely in the handwriting of Charlemagne and in the linguistic attainments of that great man. He was, that is to say, professionally interested in these subjects, but what immediately occupied his attention was how much of the furniture of a student, called affectionately the Dicker Hans, he'd be able to afford to purchase next term. Fat Hans, having obtained his doctorate with a thesis on the laws of Charmaine, and being about to vacate the desirable rooms that he had hitherto occupied over a port butcher's shop in the Frankfurter Strasse, J. L. F. M. H. in footnote. Imagine these classic shaven heads of Germany that I'd endeavour to describe presently being knocked together or treated with anything approaching to the disrespect and contempt which I have seen poured on the heads of the flower of English youth at Oxford or Cambridge. I have watched them, caught at such an entertainment, massed in a doorway, too shy to either get in or out or leave the asylum of the herd. The German students are men of the world. They all look like men. At any rate, the percentage of spotty boys which make up the hordes of the English university is far less, and the spots and boils of German youths are produced by quite another cause. I am being mysterious, but indeed I was myself mystified at first. I had heard that youth's hope and manhood's aim in German universities was very different from that embodied in wines and bump suppers and silver football cups and larks altogether, not omitting a slight, very slight, leaning towards the successful acquirement of scholarships. Yet the insolence of these boys was not as the insolence of Prussian officers, proud, unlettered and empty-headed, is the influence of the savage intellectual, the ferocious educated. A bookworm in a German university can be a swashbuckler too. A mugger-up of scientific facts can collect honourable scars as well. Footnote. I suppose this is physically possible, but actually it is much rarer than that an English Lord Chief Justice should possess an oar with a blade painted blue, the fact is that German university life is going through a period of change. Regarded as an apparition in an institution devoted to study, the core student is a phenomenon of the most singularly undesirable, and all the efforts of German professors of today are directed towards diminishing their number in favour of increasing that of the unattached. It has always seemed to me that the whole machinery of German education 
is extraordinarily wrong-headed and must prove fatal in the end to the german race if some such change as that which the german professoriate is trying to bring about be not very speedily effected these poor boys i give these views as being purely personal are treated at school with an educational brutality that is almost incredible in the civilized world they are hideously overworked they are unnaturally stimulated by their parents they are treated to the most brutal sarcasm by their repressed schoolmasters if in any particular they fall of absolute efficiency the suicide tale of school children in germany is without any exception whatever the most hideous feature of modern life i think no one will deny this who considers how worthy of tears a thing it is that a young child should commit suicide because it has failed to pass an examination yet this suicide rate is extraordinarily high in germany but once they have matriculated into their university the boys are turned absolutely loose upon towns singularly full of what are called temptations they have no supervision of any kind there is no gating there are no chapels the normal career of the german student of the german student who by the grace of god gets through is that he should spend two years upon the bummel in the sort of pursuit so vividly described by our author drinking beer fighting duels upsetting sentries in their boxes and making night hideous by howling at the doors of women of the town in the meantime they contract huge debts which their miserable fathers who are mostly small officials or lutheran pastors have to bankrupt themselves in order to pay if these proud creatures be not too far sunk in debauchery their third years they will spend in a scramble for items of knowledge that is almost more ignoble than their former pursuits for it has struck me very strongly when lecturing at german universities or attending lectures given by other professors that what takes place is not the pursuit of learning for the love of a mellow and lovable thing it is a frantic and bitter chase after items of knowledge each item of such knowledge being worth let us say fifty fennings a year more to the student acquiring it when he shall have reached the age of fifty it seems to me therefore that the whole system is exceedingly pernicious certainly to the body and decidedly undecorative and ungracious for the mind but of course other people will have observed other things and to the debit balance one may set the fact that one or two spotty boys at berlin or jena will certainly be interested really and unashamedly interested in the handwriting of charmaine or the rash data congress they will not be ashamed of these interests and they will not conceal them out of the idea that it is more high-spirited to be exclusively interested in the topic of who will be head of the river and eventually they will be given posts as under tax collectors or second-class post office clerks in the state to which their university belongs j l f m h and footnote entranced i used to watch these tall fine fellows entering in with their obedient dogs their handsome sticks and their noble thirsts which they extinguished in such manly mighty shopping one by one they dropped in with a nod or a tug to whoever had dropped in before them flung an order to ounced and then buried their noses in their mugs and in the profoundest college gossip for so i suppose it was i used to refer my curiosity to joseph leopold who has been a student himself but now wears enough hair to cover what in these boys used to attract my eyes and distract me from my dinner in my humble place in the outer hall i used to sit and watch those wonderful grey-green craniums like a piece of polished jade or pale lapis lazuli with a network of vague lines crawling right and left and across i once possessed a japanese doll i remember its mild broad head so like a baby's 
so much out of proportion to the rest of its body, and on which the first faint adumbrations of the down that would soon be hair were traced by the hand of a skilled Japanese artist in faint patches of an electric blue colour. And the head of this doll was exactly like the head of any German student who was fulfilling the duties incidental to his position, and who means you to know it by these presents. He is not an escaped convict. Not even a convict would stand being shaved and pared down to the very quick, like this. Nothing but fanaticism of a sort could accomplish the state of mind which endures willingly, nay proudly, such an appalling act of disfigurement. No, this student that I see before me has simply proved his courage, and is continuing daily to prove a state of courage that no man could impugn. He has gained a position that is eminently worth while in this troublesome world of pugnacious fellow students with their sharp, flat, duelling swords so dreadfully handy, for he is a duelist, and these are honourable scars gained in single combat. He has shown the stuff he is made of and proved his manhood in half a dozen or so fights. Why should he allow the marks of his courage to fade away on cheek and jaw when they are a sign for all adversaries to stand off and not provoke him? It is glory, glory that might fade, but is not allowed to do so. To that end, salt and other disturbers of natural healing are rubbed into the raw wound. I repeat, it is worth while. What matter that your sweetheart can hardly look at you without laughing, or your wife luxuriate in your fond connubial gaze without dreading a mishap? You infallibly suggest to outsiders l'homme qui rit, and though Victor Hugo implies that the love of Duchess Josiane stood the shock, we are not told whether the grin of the romantic mountebank was not perpetuated in some English nursery. Josiane was an English lady of the court of Queen Anne. The standard of looks in Germany is not, and perhaps never was, so high. The German Frau, too, is reported submissive, and knowing the provenance of these scars, does not jest at them, but respects and cherishes her doughty knight of the rueful countenance. The institution is as old as the hills. Though these combats are nominally forbidden, it is not easy to carry out the law and fly in the face of national custom. Duels used to be fought in the open, not necessarily under the sky, but in some large semi-public hall or room in the house of the corps on whose behalf the fight is undertaken. However, the forces of sweetness and light have objected, and the authorities have formally charged to prevent it. The belligerents and their ring of friends go out to some rather distant clearing in the woods, driving there with some slight pretense of secrecy. They take a competent surgeon along with them, for he is quite sure to have some work to do. Certain self-preserving preparations are gone through before the two combatants face each other. They put up masks to shield the eyes and gorgerettes to protect the throat, but the top of the head, the cheeks, the nose and mouth are left vulnerable. The favourite stroke of the flat swords used in this ferocious game seems to be directed at the top of the head. The result of the dexterous cut at once provides a cunning piece of work for the surgeon. Supposing you slice with the thin sharp knife used by the professional dispenser of ham in a pork shop, the top of a very thin skinned orange that has not been boiled to make it look big and swelled. You do not slice it quite off, but up to the last tenuous piece of connecting fibre. Then suppose someone else forthwith lays it neatly on again, pressing the edges closely together, and with dexterous needle and thread makes the work sure. The thin-skinned orange is a good parallel to the thinly covered scalp of the student from which his brother duelist, with the flat of his sword, neatly takes off a layer of skin and whistle. 
The delicate operation of joining it again is the surgeon's job. The appearance of the head when healed will be that of nearly all students' heads. The scars lay in circles all round the top of the skull instead of criss-cross. You can sit at concert or cinematograph and contemplate at your leisure something like a blank school map demonstrating facts of physical geography. The watersheds and rivers will be indicated in faint blue hues meandering over a pallid, dimly shaded surface. And that is what your eyes rest on for the whole of the evening. And you are glad to be spared such a prolonged vision of the cuts over the cheek or jaw. I cannot, no, I cannot, be brought by Joseph Leopold's arguments to see the justification for such voluntary imposition of physical ugliness. You mouth, you ape, you make yourself faces, says Hamlet, and such faces. The swollen, puffy cheek, bloated like the contents of a pan of red-coloured jam that bubbles as it comes to the boil, or seared or drawn inwards, as if all the teeth had been pulled out through the livid cheek. There is no excuse for a man making such a beast of himself to see, for the head pass en cours. The proud protagonist may condescend to go hair over it when the time for his youthful follies is past. At any rate, he is obliged to wear a hat. Every man and woman, too, must in Germany. It is a terrible solecism to omit the head covering. But this grotesque rictus, which meets you suddenly round a street corner before you have time to avert your gaze, makes you long to degrade courage from the rank of the virtues. These cuts, as soon as they are perpetrated, have to be attended to on the spot, as I have said. And this is where the crux, the last fine shade of stoicism, comes in. It is not enough to endure the evil. The warrior must endure the cure as well, without flinching. Sitting stiffly in a wooden chair, it may be in the heart of the spring woods, with brooks rippling and birds calling, with his victorious enemy and all the members of his corps standing attentive round him, the gory victim of a superior sense of honour must suffer in cold blood the exceedingly painful business of being sewn up without flinching in the very slightest degree. The practice needle goes in and out, the birds sing on, and the brook ripples, and a dozen or so of eager eyes are fixed on him. He must not show by moan or movement that he is a man of feeling. To wince, to flinch, the flicker of an eyelid is to be shamed, disgraced and cast out from the corps whose honour he has fought for. Until this end he must fight, or all is in vain. And it is fact that the duelist generally stands the ultimate test of courage successfully and is not afraid to fight again another day as soon as his reputation grows a little stale and needs renewing in the eyes of his compeers. This is the sort of man who possesses Marburg in and out of term time. Even in the vacation, the Stammtischen are fairly crowded. The streets in vacation are rather empty because the students take the opportunity of long walks in the country when not recalled hour by hour for classes and lectures. And the country round Marburg is not tainted with suburbanity, like the environs of Oxford, where you have to wade through miles of mean streets before you come even to the Port Meadow, or Cambridge, where you may walk for miles and miles and find nothing more rural than Trumpington or Chelsford. But you can walk out of the main street of Marburg, past the railway station to the Werder, or Go by the woods over the Augustenberg, or by steamer down the Lahn, an affair of twenty minutes, and then you are in the country at once. The steamer is a little motorboat engineered by a boy and a half-witted mate. The Lahn is like a backwater of the Thames, or the Warwickshire Avon at Stratford. And when I was ill, I found this little silly steamer ride very soothing. It took us slowly, stiffly, puffingly, to a village of no particular beauty or importance, with a cafe and a 
dull stony garden below which the steamer stopped there were a few tables with check table covers on them you could sit there of an afternoon and watch the dull folk landing or see the train for Kassel disappear under the tunnel on the other side of the bank and watch the little moorhens ducking about and the water rats setting out across the river till a stone thrown by some idle tea drinker headed them back it used to move me to a weak frenzy when i saw a solid lazy german stand up and try to defeat the poor beast's nice little energetic scheme then the coffee and milk in thick jugs would come and flammkuchen a horrid contrivance of cold pie crust with stewed plums strewn on it which i could not have been persuaded to eat in england and steamboat loads of dull heavy tame people would come up and i could touch their hats with my hand as they passed up the landing stage under the balcony of the tea garden but i was too weak and soon the daylight faded it was late september and the railway arch leading to the tunnel grew dark and portentous like a troll's cave and swathes of oily mist began to hang over the river then we descended the water stairs and puffed along in the low boat until the towers of the elizabethan kirche loomed big and near sometimes we walked to raubach over the quiet ordinary english-looking fields one could picture faust and wagner students both taking their memorable walk across these cultivated hills and discoursing of forbidden pernicious things while the dreadful black poodle who turned up from no one knows where and accompanies them circles ever nearer and nearer through the corn stalks heinrich faust and wagner are both men of the world well versed in all the current magic of society devil law they know both of them quite well that the poodle is the devil they are not afraid but faust's friend wagner does not quite like it he says something not much about the poodle's inconvenient shadowing and those few calm remarks their slightness give a very complete feeling of artistic discomfort and diablerie but when i was recovering we used to get up as far and as high as the wilhelmsturm perched on the very end of the great moor and then i found myself in a region as wild as the lake district in england i had to go round the easier way which is the longest but at every turn of the zigzag we met perspiring fraus being positively boosted up the steepest slopes by their husbands and sweethearts they did prodigies of endurance these women and their men were strong and kind i no longer need to wonder how the great trilithons of stonehenge were brought to amesbury husbandly devotion and the joy of a holiday can work miracles and there was a kermesse going on on top the great barrels of beer which these brave souls were to drink had got up there too and in much the same way no doubt if you go west towards kappel and up to the frauenberg you find yourself en plein pays de geste but it is a long way to the queer-shaped volcanic hill covered with ruins of different periods ghosts haunted full of buried treasure here there is a lonely forester's lodge where a family has lived for generations you drink tea there i mean coffee and the old grandmother in her decent black gown her peaked face looking like the shadow of her personable daughter-in-law in the prime of life and holding a little sticky grandchild by the hand comes and asks you how you like the sand cushion and wishes you god speed on your walk home and the walk home rather late with the sun making haste to be down and you hope it won't be before you get home but you know it will how queer it is you walk along timidly on soft leafed bestrewn ways under the shade of tall pine trees so high that between the lower part of their thick boles the tricksy sun that has nearly set plays hide-and-seek 
it seems at one time utterly gone out and departed this side of the earth at another gleaming sudden and angry between the dark bars like a woodcutter's fire you hear the crunch of your own tread pit a pat the forest is so big and you are so little and every now and then you stop and think that you hear the rustle of a deer or a wild boar es kann vor sein it might easily be says joseph leopold yes even faust and wagner with their conversation so skilfully woven of philosophic doubts would seem modern here mailed knights shall be riding to the succour of distressed maidens i should see the shiver of grey steel flickering across the vistas to be lost again in the woodland shades it is not only strangers but quasi strangers like myself who feel the uneasy charm that hangs over these birdless thickets once we had been to a kermesse up at the Frauenberg, a scene of gaiety light costumes dancing merry-go-rounds and happy people drinking beer over wooden tables up there on the hill among the ruins but still when the sun began to go down there was a fearful return journey back to marburg to be faced people started in company and like grimm's little tailors they all sang to scare terror away joseph leopold always chants in a loud voice the leader of his country and his compatriots seem to like it there is an austrian yodel song drunten auf dem grünen Auer steht ein birnbaum so blau and if one meets as we did that day three of the bells of the kermesse returning home to recount the little triumphs to the mütterchen in marburg be sure that they will be wreathed together arm in arm walking in step and singing in unison some such song as joseph leopold's they are catholics so he tells me for they are not in costume catholics repudiate the kaiser's encouragement of protestant survivals we lose sight of them they walk faster than we do and i am oppressed by the sense of the hour and full of an unreasoning terror lest we miss the way for the sun has really gone down and the light has forsaken the green leaves and the colour of them is heavy and vapid and the chills of night begin to creep in it is always thus and i am always afraid it is getting too dark to study the blue and red and yellow marks on the tree trunks that tell us the way to go we are embarked on a yellow trail and it behoves us to examine nearly every tree at least i think so though joseph leopold doesn't i am afraid i shall hear a wild cat scream the last journeyman disappears there is a sudden declivity in the path and the sound of the pretty girls carolling fades out of hearing all my days in this land are rounded off by a silence the silence of german forest end of section nine section ten of the desirable alien at home in germany by Violet Hunt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 9. Chests and Costumes In Marburg, which is in Hessen Castle, consequently in Prussia, I looked out of my bedroom window one morning and saw something like a kingfisher picking its way in little sharp erratic dashes and capricious loiterings here and there, on the cobblestones in front of the Elizabethan Kirche. The day was young, and it was the festival of Zedon. The kingfisher was a very young peasant, one of the early birds that find their way into town first on a feast day. It was so early that she obviously did not know what to do with herself. Presently she was joined by another flashing iridescent creature, arrayed likewise in all the primitive colours. Together the two passed under the window and stood about under the trees of the Marbacher Weg and gossiped. I watched them lazily, as an invalid does. 
Their lower circumference was very wide. Their heads formed the apex of a cone, crowned with the red cap like the little round button at top of the mandarin in the rhyme. Their bodices were of velvet and their neckerchiefs of white silk. Their scarves, carefully negligently tied, hung back over their shoulders. Their buckled shoes clicked on the stones. They seemed as quiet and decorous as it was possible to be, while their outside was like a leaping coloured flame. Under the trees of the allée they passed and repassed, flaring like a couple of hummingbirds or parakeets, in gait as demure as doves and as gentle. And by and by, as the day wore on, the streets of Marburg were full of these gem-like figures, all come in from the surrounding villages, moving as boldly, as easily, as theatrical stars on the front boards of a theatre. Marburg as a decor is rather sophisticated, an old town full of bits, but mainly modernised. There is a large plate-glass windowed shop, whose recesses display the finest confections of the best milliners in Frankfurt. Frankfurt, where as everybody who dresses knows, you can buy as good clothes as you can at Monte Carlo or Paris. In the back street is the shop where the peasants come and buy the materials for these dresses, costing very often not less than ten or sixteen pounds. Over the door of the shop is inscribed Landestragen. In another shop are dolls dressed out in costume. We all think the costume very old, but as a matter of fact it came in with the Reformation, and it will be dead ere now, only that Prussia encourages it. Footnote. I do not know what may be our author's authority for making this statement, nor do I fancy that she knows herself. The fact is that it is extremely difficult to date any given costume, and many varieties of costumes are to be seen together in the city of Marburg. The one which our author has more particularly described is that worn near the villages of Amöneburg and Kirchhain. It dates in all probability from the 16th century, or possibly from the 18th, since the men who wear costume on holidays carry under their arms cocked hats and wear knee-breeches, silk stockings and short round jackets. The women of the hamlet upon the Frauenberg, on the other hand, about six miles away, wear costumes very much resembling those of the Boulogne fishwives of today. And since they are descendants of Huguenot emigrants into Hessen Castle, it is obvious that their costume dates from at least before the revocation of the Edict of Nantes. The broad plain of Hessen Castle is everywhere diversified by pinnacles of basalt, upon each of which is planted a little town, varying in religion, in costume, and in habits. Roughly speaking, the Protestant villages, encouraged by the Prussian government, wear costumes, varying from the highly coloured one of a Mönneburg to the sombre black petticoat, black bodice and white stomacher, white stockings, black pumps with silver buckles, garters of green with long ends, and a particularly odd black headdress, in form exactly resembling a Phrygian cap, which, when working in the fields, they replace by an immense straw hat, and shaped like the chapeau de paille of Rubens. This latter costume is mostly found in the north of the province, and assimilates fairly closely to that of the Bükeburgerinnen of the Grand Duchy of Lippe. This Grand Duke, like the Government of Prussia, encourages his subjects by every reasonable inducement ranging to very substantial money prizes to wear the national costume. Prussia has done the same thing in Alsace-Lorraine, the idea being everywhere identical, namely by means of the costume, to encourage German national feeling. Roughly speaking, on the other hand, the villages whose population is Roman Catholic or considerably Jewish do not wear the costume because these varieties of humanity have no particular reason to love 
Prussia. And for the same reason, there is comparatively little costume to be seen in the Grand Duchy of Hessen Darmstadt und bei Rhein. J. L. F. M. H. End footnote. Costume used as a political weapon is beyond me, and Joseph Leopold must correct me if I do not read him aright. Meantime, I found costume more naturally by persons to the manner born very good to look upon. I, who up to now had only seen examples of the German peasant at fancy dress balls in London, set amid policemen and pillar boxes and cooks and gitanos. Every plain, broad featured girl of my acquaintance used to be advised by candid friends and relations to plait her hair or wear a switch and go as Gretchen or a German peasant. So cheap and so easy, my dear. Here in Marburg, I was told that if I wished to see costume at its best, and plenty of it, I must go to the market on Saturday. The market was held, I understood, on the top of the hill. I lived on the bottom. So one morning we mounted the high flagged walk under a low wall shaded by a row of trees, which is the main street of Marburg. It is a sort of three-decker of a street with a cobbled causeway on one side, and an unpaved way on the other. I felt as if I were walking on a stone battlement raised in the midst of a tumbled watercourse. The raised footpath is comparatively new. How do passengers manage when the only way was a broad, unadjusted track leading up through the town to the Schloss and Palace on the top? Even in the memory of Joseph Leopold, the road up from the Elizabethan Kirche was once like a stony river bed, not unlike the course of the Elysus at Athens after a drought. Somewhere about halfway up the hill, the famous potters of Marburg used to sit and thump their wet clay. That was eighteen years ago, and now they've all taken their lathes elsewhere into side streets, where they've opened small shops. In the Marbeck of Egg, one can still see the wet discs that will be turned into bowls and dishes and the queer featureless knobs of clay that are really jugs drying on slats laid outside the shop door. Inside, the potter is to be seen hard at work, sitting at his wheel, moulding on the sides of them the conventional figures of birds, flowers and beasts he has roughly designed. If you are passing a day or two later, you can see the same pieces carried a stage further with the brown glazes run onto them, and you can buy them. The designs on the clay are mostly the same as those that have been laid upon Marburg pottery for centuries, by this potter's ancestors, probably. You can judge by the samples lying on the shelves of the museum now. The pattern is there on the modern ones, but curiously enough, the spirit seems to have departed. The design has survived, but it has thickened in the working, grown clumsier in the handling. It has lost dignity in the attempt at realism. The workman has grown meritoriously regardful of nature, but I think that the stiffness of the conventional forget-me-nots was more adapted to the surface of a bowl, and a primrose by the cup's brink should not look as if a child had carried it in a hot hand all day. Perhaps far away in England, Ruskin and his disciples, brooding over slides of botanical specimens in the Taylorian, were responsible for these sad acts of initiative on the part of a marble potter. Beasts, even modern beasts, are more satisfactory. A large white stag before the setting sun, standing bold in the centre of a yellow plate, never can look wrong. I bought some ancient examples as curiosities, some modern ones of Herr Armenhausen for use and ornament. I then recklessly confided my purchase, numbering about 30 pieces, to the Marburg railway people. It was arranged that all of it was to be securely packed in a wooden case. Between Herr Armenhausen, who made the pottery and packed it, and the speditor, who expedited it, most of it arrived in England broken. I have now two very large bones to pick with the spadito, which I shall never pick, 
as he is safely sheltered by a railway company which takes no risks. The other bone is also a picking bone, but I'm not at all sure the spadeter is to blame in the second case, since Joseph Leopold did actually get the compensation out of the vendor. I'm reminded of both of these bones as I go up the main street of Marburg past the apotheca where I buy my so expensive and so really good drugs, past the cheap draper's shop with the Jewish name, whose windows are full of seemingly soft and woollen, but internally rotten and jerry-built underclothing. Joseph Leopold is cold here and chilled to the liver, but he bears it. He won't buy the Jews' goods, for he says you can't get worse in England. Then we go past the barber's and the Damen Frisieren place, where they once washed my hair and dried it, so my sick fancy, bemused with hot and cold douches, pictures the scene, by a process of winnowing. They seem to be using flails, so violent were their measures. As I sat there, toweled, helpless and ridiculous, I observed under cover of my hair that the barber's whole family came in and assisted at his labours. They waved palm-leaf fans at me until, like Job, my hair lifted off my forehead, and I was dry, but afeared. We go past the two new houses they are building on a sort of frame of wooden cross-beams, quite irregular in shape, so that when the plaster is filled in, the new may look as like the old house it replaces as possible. But I do not think that Germans are affected enough to care to build new Rococo houses simply for pretty, as they do in England, and in order to be in the forefront of the movement which likes to reproduce old features for the sake of chic. Certainly, if we saw such houses as these two of which I am speaking in process of building in the main street of a busy English market town, among a good many modern ones, we should say, this builder is a crank who wants to show how clever he is and how much he knows. I think Germans do it because they are opportunists always, and conservative when it suits them. And the old way of building in this case agrees with their domestic arrangements and their love of sleeping warm. Sleeping warm means ingle nooks and small low windows and the rest of it. Besides, Roofs must be high-pitched for the storks that, like well-bred children, are heard but not seen in Germany. I never saw any but those two in Wieseck. Then we came to, and did not pass by for a long time, the shop with Landestragen on the fascia. For piled up in the window you can see all the materials needed to complete the dress of a peasant. The man's kittel, the woman's petticoats, cap and bodice. The cap is made and ready to wear except for the strings. And here are the handsome square fringed neck scarf, the rolls of patterned ribbon ready to be feather stitched onto the hems, the bales of red, green and blue woollen stuff for the skirts and the stamped velvet for the bodices. Who that has only seen the usually ridiculous ballroom figure, with pigtail plaited a la marguerite and draggled skirt not half short enough, that does not stick out but clings to the silk stocking legs, can form any idea of the working reality. For here it is. This shop is a miniature Whiteley, and there are shops like this in most towns, where the thrifty German peasant who feels herself in need of a new dress can buy all her materials at once, and hie her home to her distant farmstead and make it at her leisure. The materials are costly, but then she will not have any such new costumes in the course of her life, or she may have inherited one or two, as often happens. The caps, especially the very handsome seed pearl embroidered ones, are frequently passed on as heirlooms. I have three now that were bought in that very shop, and which, though good and solid, look as if they've been going for several hundred years. The petticoat is where the amateur goes wrong. The proper amount of skirts would be impossible to dance in. 
and that is why the german peasant woman working in the fields discards all her petticoats but the upper one on a hot day i have seen a girl's defroc lying on the ground beside her reaping hook and the pot of beer she has carried out for her husband or if she is not actually affluent enough to possess more than one skirt or perhaps two she ekes it out with a sort of bolster worn round the hips which sets out the garment as properly as if it were one of many and procures her the indispensable freedom of movement necessary for working or dancing no clinging woollen clogging their movement for them and perhaps it is this clever theory of toilette put into practice which permits of the fine large swinging gait with which the german bauernfrau treads the furrows it is this long stride which is absolutely characteristic of the walk of the working woman in germany and it is so pronounced that it is patent to any casual observer from the window of a railway train and talking of the rationale of costume it strikes me that the make of the hessian peasant's bodice and that of the present swiss female costume and of the english once embodies the very sound if unconscious theory that the stiffer and solider parts of the clothing that is those intended to procure support and warmth should be worn on the outside the good old english word for corset suggests it and the sense is exemplified in the use of that word for the wooden splats and lards which hold a vessel in process of construction together till it leaves its birthplace in the shipyard several nations seem to agree sartorially that this stay or support should be worn outside the shirt or shift the french to corset that is stiffen hold up from which they get the noun corset holds the same notion a curious reversion to this theory of toilette is sometimes carried out in the water at dieppe i observed one lady whom everybody else observed not on account of her costume which was normal but on account of her beauty which was abnormal she was the late miss kitty savile clark wearing day after day for her morning dip black satin stiffly boned corset over her red mayor and looking like a well-designed poster as she sat hanging her legs over the sides of the boat to which she had swum i believe it was practically only in the last century that the old process was reversed and what i will call women's immense and vaunted staying power hidden underneath her softer exterior she used to be a pomegranate now she is a peach to me the present fashion mendaciously suggests that natural resilience alone bears up this fraud that is woman she is seeking thus to maintain an appearance of firm flesh underneath the soft bodice of silk or skilfully folded material but he who has danced with the seemingly yielding fair is aware of the local stiffness that informs the shape he pilots by the flat of his palm round the ballroom in fact my partners have in confidence informed me that they would not have it otherwise and that they find it easier to negotiate the varied contours of window jam and cornice and evade the thundering masses of human conglomerate that may bear down on the navigator with something solid to get hold of but the modern swiss bodice which still obtains and the german one too worn honestly outside is a piece de resistance in more senses than one for it is made to lace and not to fit a girl may wear the bodice which slight and young she could scarcely fill and a german matron if you take her young enough is sometimes as slender as any gazelle until such a time as she is a full-grown woman and can only adjust her corsage and exigencies with the aid of pins and for a worker the outside corselet has obvious advantages such as have been acquired over here by the wearers of the kimono sleeve now come down to the slums there is a style of dress in germany adopted by the middle class which borrows from the peasant dress one principle that of the independent sleeve 
inexperienced dressmakers must love the reform clyde since it evades a ticklish bit of fitting known as the underarm seam and though evolution has added a pair of sleeves to the corselet in germany the freedom and play of the chest is still permitted and i observe that the more slovenly type of german machen avails herself fully of the relief of missing hook and bursting buttonhole the skirt is always made of woollen material and nearly always the handy peasant woman weaves it herself choosing her colours carefully the upper skirt is generally of a very bright colour the under petticoats of a duller hue unless indeed they happen to have been degraded from the rank of upper skirt to a more humble position friend go lower and if young women are partial to a strong vivid green i have noticed that the older ones prefer a soberish grey but always there is the broad bright border composed of several rows of figured ribbon these rows bring the trimming of such skirt fully two feet up from the bottom the other day turning out a drawer of old things i came upon several lengths of old silk english ribbon patterned very much as these german ribbons are and so quote good as almost to be able to stand alone like the satin dress of the elder miss browning of cranford the old-fashioned caps are set with coloured stones and embroidered with seed pearls those new-fashioned that are for sale in the marburg shop are less elaborate and a trifle tawdry they are all small not much larger than half an orange and they are worn set carefully on the top of the knob of hair scraped up from the whole head with wide strings of black ribbon with a picot border depending from them and flung back the knob of hair sad to relate that is generally all there is of it at all events when the german peasant wife has reached the age of thirty the marguerite plait if it ever existed has been frightened away by the good soul's habit of intensive hair cultivation from earliest youth she has strained it back a la peggotty into the tight little knob i have been speaking of so that it all goes quite comfortably into the circumference of a quarter pot footnote the costume of the alaisienne which dates quite definitely from the year eighteen forty includes a similar odd little cap perched on the top of the head but such headdresses these very beautiful women only wear upon sundays and feast days alleging that to wear them more often would ruin their hair thus once more do they seem to manage these things better in france j l f m h end footnote and pity tis tis true an english old maid of a hundred odd years in a cathedral town scrappy and hairless according to the chivalrous saying could boast of her scant locks as against the having of a happy and careless german peasant matron of thirty the bodice of black or maroon or dark blue velvet stamped with a flowery pattern and worn on holidays or the other humbler one for work days made of printed cotton or linen has a little belt of quilling of self material all round the decolletage which is of course never a decolletage at all it is always filled in with the very clumsiest arrangement imaginable a neckerchief of coloured silk or white linen folded with some skill afresh every day round the column of the neck itself the fringed worsted or silk scarf of vivid hue is carelessly knotted and the ends arranged to hang down the back it is a curious arrangement for which one can discover no apparent artistic or hygienic reason coloured worsted stockings and shoes of felt with embroidered toes complete this costume which i have observed chiefly at marburg marburg is a protestant place catholics don't wear costume and at marburg sashes are worn but i have not seen them in the shops for sale i suppose they represent an individual fancy of the wearer at the kirschweih fetes and the kermesses i have sometimes hovered around examples of these sashes attracted by the extraordinary garish clotted effect of the 
colours introduced into them. I have gone quite close to find out exactly the material used. Berlin wools. I have never seen anything in the nature of decoration so vivid, so savage, so poisonous looking as these innocent toilette accessories worn by very young girls and evidently made by hand, just as their English cousins made chair covers and mats and tea cosies out of the same stuff in the sixties. In Germany, I suppose, fashions die harder. England took Berlin wool work from Germany in the first instance. And Matilda and Georgina Maria slavishly adopted this mode along with their new Hanoverian rulers in 1714. And it died with Gladys and Phyllis and Muriel, who took on cool work. That is dead again. Lotta and Gretchen, with whom Berlin wool work originated, still wear their wool flowers gaily, and on regions the other ladies never knew. For in England, I fancy it was never used as a personal decoration. I am aware that the present fashion in Paris is for hats trimmed with wreaths composed of the early Victorian symbol, and that breast knots of a single wool work, double dahlia with leaves to match, are the rage or have been. We bought some old hand sewn embroidered linen tablecloths in the Landers Trigon shop to make bed curtains with for an old English bed, and mounted farther into the heart of Marburg. There, among the little alleys like dirty filaments that wind in and out and up the steep monticules on which the town of Marburg is built, lives the great, the wicked, Herr Dash. He lives in a little court, a court where Gretchen might have lived, and which Hawes Craven might have copied for Henry Irving. I wish to feast my eyes on the three good truen which he possessed and was offering us for sale. Footnote. Truen are, as a rule, the bride chests which accompany the Hessian bride from her father's house to her husband's upon the day of the wedding. Upon such an occasion, these truen contain all the linen that will be used and all the costumes that will be worn by that bride during the remainder of her life. There should be costumes for the wedding, for church goings, for mournings, for widowhood, and the shroud of burial. And the strictly orthodox bride should have spun or woven, at least with the assistance of her mother, every single piece that the chest contains. Similarly, the chest of a nun was to be considered as her bridal chest, and to contain all the garments she will ever wear, from the beginning of her novitiate to her burial. J. L. F. M. H. and footnote. We intended to show no eagerness, but to purchase them the day before departure. We meant to make him send them to us in England, where they would do us credit. In Germany, only Art Nouveau goes down, and for our German house we had to furnish accordingly. It was with regard to this purchase that we again encountered the Spedator. But it was not the Spedator who cheated us this time. It was the clever old Jew who took an extra pound for packing the Truen and sent them all the way to Camden Hill with a bit of sacking lightly laid around their contours as a woman drapes a handsome opera cloak over her shoulders, not so much to keep her warm as to show off the beautiful lining of the cloak and the beautiful bust it covers so ill. However, an equally clever German Rechtsanwalt, who was not a Jew, got us out of it. He took the matter into court and forced Herr Dash to disgorge the money we had given him for packing, and with it we paid for repair and dilapidations. The Rechtsanwalt's fee was only ten shillings, there are some advantages of being a German subject. And they were beautiful pieces of work, these Truen. One of them came from the convent of Kloster Arnsburg, where the nuns had used it to keep their vestments. It has three kings cut in low relief on its sides, and thick pilasters to the doors. 
another carved and inlaid i may mention that it was this chest that suffered the worst from the evil effects of careless packing for it arrived with all its inlays starting out of its head and its painted figures blurred and damaged is of pale light wood and it has been painted at a later date the third the smallest and most mysterious of all puzzled and continued to puzzle the greatest connoisseur in furniture in the world a man whose boast it is that show him only a square inch of any piece whatever and he will engage to tell you its nature make and provenance in this chest decorated with stags and horses and plants of a curious convention resembling the hieratic lotus flower joseph leopold keeps his suits with great inconvenience but immense artistic satisfaction we passed on and found the market-place at last it is situated on a level plateau and closed in from the view of the valley of the Lahn on three sides by houses and on the fourth by an old town hall flowers in window boxes are on every sill of every window of this otherwise austere looking building and the houses are all painted i have never been in italy but i fancy that the painted houses the costumed women and the natural hues of fruit and flowers altogether made up such a blaze of colour as italy could not exceed though she might equal at any rate i am not aware that the houses in italy are notched faceted and blazoned in stripes and dots of all the strongest primary colours and imagine what it is to have flashed on you all at once a bed of hydrangeas calcellarias nymphophilas nasturtiums and gladioli peonies dahlias fuchsias begonias and pelargoniums heated irritable passionate flowers with these sort of latin terminations rush to one's mind at once and you may have an idea of this german market-place on that sunny day in mid-september of all the flowers named in my list none i think were actually present except for the gladioli and there were a great many of these and then there were the costumes and the women's cheeks the green very green cabbages and the most golden pumpkins and extremely purple plums and deeply tinged apples there were also the clear translucent shades of yellow cheeses and tubs of milky curds and kegs of butter a good german butter very white like castile soap that is as it should be it takes you some months of an emménage to realise that it isn't your husband's shaving soap which has got onto the breakfast table by mistake the awnings of the stalls too were gaily striped and laughing higgling men and women passed to and fro under them every one was selling and everybody buying at the same time which seems an eminently satisfactory arrangement nobody stayed in one place long except a few old very old women immovably fixed behind a tub of butter or curds and with a round umbrella stretched over them sometimes one of them when she had done good business sold a whole kegful perhaps rose and pattered away slowly into the church hard by to mutter a grateful orison and so back again to the silent session among all the noise End of section 10. Section 11 of The Desirable Alien at Home in Germany by Violet Hunt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 10. Waiters and Policemen. I have known many waiters, German and not otherwise, but I have never known a waiter like Le Bel Ernst. Mais c'est la folie joseph leopold used to exclaim when he heard me expatiating in season and out of season on the monumental virtues of this young man i will try to describe him of the images conjured up by the word waiter ernst possesses only one attribute he is german a waiter who is not german is superhuman unless he is swiss 
and all wait as a slavish, seedy, sycophantish, anemic, impertinent, and indifferent. Ernst cannot be thus described. Firm-fleshed, stout but not fat, he is positively handsome in a blond Napoleonic way, with a chest and a stomach like a soldier's, that is to say, decently and becomingly bombé, under his white apron of service, not servitude. This is the best physical description I can give of the life and soul, and may I add, of the stomach, of the R Hotel in Marburg. Of course, his erect carriage might be attributed to the fact that he has served, but then German waiters in England, who cringe and fawn and poke, have presumably also served their country for a span. But the anemia of the English variety is supposed to be the result of the conditions, so unfavourable to digestion, of life in the restaurant, the hurried meals, the close atmosphere. But who that had seen Ernst snatch a hasty mouthful halfway through his labours of the evening meal would doubt if he himself took these conditions into consideration at all. We used to see him when he thought there was time, or might possibly be time, a poor three minutes or so, settle himself at one of the tables, fetch a plateful from the buttery hatch, and begin to stoke, with one eye on the favoured customer and the other on the sale in general. After three mouthfuls or so, the urgent wanton call would come, and Ernst would rise calmly and attend any felt want, and as easily subside into his place again, eat some more, to rise again at least five times, before his immediate hunger could possibly be satisfied. I have never seen anything in England like the machine-like efficiency of this firm piece of flesh and blood. I was never tired of setting it in motion, and watching the ensuing steady roll across the Speisesaal. I admired the sweep of the arm, the indicative flourish with which he pointed out the table where he and the management would prefer one to sit, and the adroitness with which he effected the removal of soiled napkins and outworn dishes. His eye, bright, small, and universally bestowed, his firm white hands that deposited the dish one had asked for and none other, in front of one on the really clean white tablecloth. I remember the first time I saw him. Weary and dejected, we had both flung ourselves onto a red plush covered settee in front of the table that seemed to us the most likely and pleasant, and beckoned condescendingly to the low and grin like figure that hovered, if anything so solid could be said to hover, in the dim penumbra of the unlighted part of the Speisensaal near the door where stag's antlers with heavy coats hung upon them rendered the wall one sheet of mysterious blackness. Close to the white figure outlined thereon was the bar, where glancing brass levers functioned, and bottles of liqueurs with their variegated labels bearing names of awe stood about, handled by a forbidding-looking female who bore no sort of affinity to their vicious and decadent contents, Behind this angular female, a more opulently contoured variety of the sex seemed to be continually surging in from the kitchen behind. There were steaming beetle-browed women, bearing plates that seemed heavy, and which they slammed down as if they were very hot, in front of the austerer Hebe who manipulated the levers and poured out the foaming box that were to wash down the viands. There Lohengrin stood, while Elsa and Ortrud functioned appropriately under his direction. Majestically he commanded, and never spoke. Le bel Ernst, for this was he, began his ministrations on our behalf by politely heading us off the Stammtisch, where it would have been death to us to presume to sit, and then, like an ambulant, hardly animated penny in the slot machine, Complacently, but not slavishly, he took our order. He was a trifle austere at first, for he did not know us, but even later on I cannot say he smiled. He did not at any rate smile with his lips. An American might have said that he smiled a very little all over. 
At any rate, we were just able to infer that he liked us. Of course, there are no waiters like Ernst in England, and the reason is obvious. Ernst had no desire to learn English, for he can do very well without it. England only gets the inferior artist who thinks to raise his salary by the acquiring of this merely meretricious advantage. Ernst, on the face of him, needs none of these adventitious aids to success. He manages quite well without talking anybody's language at all. We fell across quite another variety of the German waiter at home at Trier. The good, dear, nervous soul spoke all languages, but was conversant with none. He had been in England, and he detected the trace of the alien in me at once. One evening, when we were going to be out late and we started early, I left the task of ordering dinner to him. Trust me, madame, you shall have a dinner, all right, he had wagged his head and said. And when weary with our long day, riding in a train all the way up the Mosel to cock him, we came in and sat down lumpishly and called for our mess, it proved to be the worst dinner we had ever struck in all our days impossible fish swimming in water that had not been adequately drained tasteless chops unredeemed by garlic or onion a pudding yes a pudding of rice and jam i, know, I cannot tell you don't eat he remarked bitterly chagrined and i had ordered such a nice little dinner for you one that i thought you would like all english Cuisine à l'eau. We explained very softly, but we were not leaving just yet, that we weren't English, didn't want to be English, would have hated English cookery even if we had been English. Poor dear. He was not angry, but saddened and depressed for the remainder of our stay. He wore no nice white apron tied round his middle like Le Belle Ernst, only the wretched, swallow-tailed, bastard evening dress of usage. I have never, I believe, seen Ernst without his eternal apron, with the delicate tape strings tied carefully round his waist, as it were, pour désigner un peu la taille. No, I am forgetting. I saw Ernst once in Mufti, and it was on a Sunday. Coming round the corner from Marchese's, a sailor hat was taken off to me, not flourished, and I received a smart bow and a muttered salutation from a blue serge-clad youth with a jaunty stick in his hand, which warned me to say my obligatory tug and look at the holiday face and get up of the light of the Speisesaal. Ants knew what every waiter ought to know and never does, or else he knows it incorrectly, and that is, the times of trains and buses, and the best way to use the modes of transit obtaining in the district in which one happens to be. He was able to tell us where to go for tea, or where to walk, and where to buy an English newspaper, and what day the cinematograph treated its patrons to a change of programme. A matter of the first importance to Joseph Leopold, and he even took upon himself the duty of telling us when to look out of the window. We happened to be at Marburg on Sedan Day. English people have no idea what an important day that is in Germany, at least English people who have not toiled up the vine-clad slopes above Rudesheim to the Denkmal, the immense memorial Germany raised to the dead of the Franco-Prussian War. On a pouring wet day, the whole town council of Marburg turned out in tailcoats and top hats and with white scarves round their middles, and went in procession up the narrow main streets. All the students' corps went too, and many costumed persons belonging to the old, custom-ridden town. It was a long, long business, and before they had all passed out of sight, our breakfast was quite cold. The festivities lasted all day and well into the evening, the procession passed again, just after dusk, and this time the little boys were furnished with coloured Chinese lanterns, 
past our windows they went again and up the steep main street right through the town to the schloss on top they looked like an army of great pink toadstools as they climbed and were lost to view we followed and took our after-dinner coffee as usual at marchese's so as to see a little more of them there are a great many cafes in marburg but marchese's is the more popular out of the dim ill-lighted street one passes into a covered way leading to a bar and then further to a room with a large stove in the middle dotted with little tables where women and men sit drinking coffee and beer and syrups and grenadines and eating large slabs of indigestible cake for their soul's entertainment they read the daily papers glance at the illustrated ones and play dominoes or knit we passed through that room on to the veranda open to the night this veranda is perched on a dizzy height and seems to project far over the back street of the town and one looks down onto the river lahn it reminded me of the view from one of the canons houses onto the banks at durham marburg often does remind me of my native city it has just such another embattled situation we took up our places in the balcony and our legs and the ferules of our umbrellas got wound up with the spokes of the railing balusters then we ordered ices and coffee after dinner coffee at a restaurant in germany is always served with the accompaniment of a small squat glass of water with a spoon laid formally across it why i asked joseph leopold in order that you may sanitarily dip your spoon into the water before you use it in your coffee he replies then he gets hold of simplicissimus as usual and reads me the jokes translating when necessary and it is mostly necessary we amuse ourselves by trying to see where the joke comes in we hardly hope to be amused with the joke itself with a good deal of bon volonté we sometimes are able to perceive a gleam of humour only a gleam but there is always plenty of savage spite against the kaiser and indecencies apropos of this great personage far more serious than those slanderous suggestions with regard to king edward which exhibited once on a paris kiosk were so deeply resented by england his subjects relish this sort of thing and the kaiser does not care to spoil their fun so it is tacitly agreed that he is to be fair game though high game it seems to me in more senses than one for joseph leopold does not think of translating some of these poems to me then we go home again by the low way that is to say by the road which we have been looking down on from marchese's balcony the streets that part from it at right angles to scale the hill are like staircases so steep are they we have to make a loop to go down we go past the great fortress-like houses closed and unlit the inhabitants are all out at the civic merrymaking and the spectacular great dane usually waits at the door crouched under the carven porch until his master shall return and take him into the house with his wife and children and everything else that is his on the doorsteps of a house tenanted by folk of inferior social standing who did not run to a guardian great dane we noticed a little patient girl sitting with a baby in her arms the small unlit window of the house behind her seemed to be crammed with articles of a confused description by day it was probably an unromantic hovel but at night it was weird and mysterious like the house where gretchen lived with her mother until faust came the child looked very forlorn and we asked why she did not take the baby into the house and warm it she replied that her mother had gone out and put the key in her pocket what a cruel mother i said to joseph leopold not at all the whole family went out on a spree 
and the mother probably sent the child on home because it was getting late. The contents of the shop are too valuable to be left at the mercy of a key in the hands of a child. And it is a warm night. Don't be so ready with your sympathy in Germany. But what about the police, with their excellent dogs you tell me about? I ask pertinaciously. The German police are not allowed to carry arms any more than the English, but they are given better support than a truncheon. Footnote. This is a nonsense. The German police carry swords, revolvers, carbines, knuckle dusters, bludgeons, and any lethal weapon that may occur to the individual fancy of the police minister of that particular state. And the reason why that door was so carefully locked, and that although you could trust almost every lay inhabitant of almost every German city or village, you stand in deadly fear of the policeman, who, if he does not rob and murder you, will certainly subject you to blackmail, if he gets a chance of getting hold of your papers. The police dogs are generally under the control of members of a more intelligent and trustworthy surety force, who are less armed and much less disastrous to have in the house. J. L. F. M. H. End footnote. The trained dog, which they are privileged to take about with them, is a far more efficient weapon of defence and attack. Though they cannot, in the heat of argument, recklessly draw or fire it, the dog won't stand by and see his master attacked. He is trained to wait to go for the assailant until that pass has been reached. Then, I am told, there is no need as there is so often in England, for some plucky woman to rush into the melee and blow the whistle depending from the neck of the helpless guardian of the law. The dog is quite equal to his work. He is not exactly savage, but he is not to be petted by any chance stranger when he is out on business. It took me, it takes me, a long time to realise that, for I always want to talk to animals when I meet them. But these police dogs are not inviting, though I believe people do buy them and take them to their hearths and homes in England. And by a succession of steep gradients, we are at last come to the low, level road, and look up and see the light shining through my Casey's balcony, the frail projection where we had only half an hour ago been sitting and supping our coffee. I began, why don't they... That warm autumn night, when young blood was probably excited by the fete day, we heard a serenade. It happened to be sung under our windows, but was addressed to the young wife of the son of Philippe Shaw, the cub flashes over the way, newly married that very morning. On the rough cobblestones under the pale starlight, a little choir of six sang carefully without wildness or enthusiasm, but with a grave and touching earnestness, three part songs of an epithalamic character. They must have known the parts by heart, for they had no light except a tiny lantern slung on a stick to illuminate the score of the conductor. The songs were so sweet, so serious, so dignified in their dreaming cadences, that we two, hanging stilly over our window bars, wished the concert would go on all night, to the accompaniment of the quiet chime from the tower of the Elizabethan Kirche. But no. The three songs were duly sung through, and there were no encores permitted. We outsiders did not dare to offer our thanks, and none came from the windows, gratefully flung open of the bridal chamber. Soon, in silence and soft unison, as they had chanted, the six songsters departed, and the pit-a-pat of their felt-shod feet sounded faintly, and then not at all, on the cobblestones. The window opposite was gently closed. Trust the German to dread the night air, even on his wedding night. End of section 11
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 11 A Landgräfin and her Confessor. We solemnly did Marburg. The English mother of Joseph Leopold wished it. I always defer doing on principle. I prefer to let the spirit of the place sink well in before inspecting the monuments. One should happen on monuments, one should have an opportunity to stare long at their outsides before entering. And even on the footing of a mere tourist, is there any holier joy than to walk forth with faith and without a guidebook? Picking one's way among the garbage, the horrible everyday detritus of no particular street of the city you are living in, one comes suddenly upon some lovely flower of the Middle Ages, some gem of architecture, in a vile setting of hovels and flaunting shop signs. One realises that it is a relic of value. One has the pleasant sensation of having been slightly beforehand with the guidebook which one consults as soon as one gets home. Guidebooks are strangely fallacious. But the first monument you see on issuing from the railway station at Marburg, itself a thing of beauty, is the Elizabethan Kirche with its two tall towers. If I had not known that it was the Elizabethan Kirche, I might have neglected this famous church that St. Elizabeth built and gave to the Catholics, and that Protestants stole. I may mention that I am never allowed to see a church purely as an archaeologist, or even as a student of architecture, which I am not. It is one of the circumstances of my case that the church militant view faces my own patient lack of interest on any other ground than artistic and historical ones. That great tourney of extermination of vested interests, which was the Reformation, is Joseph Leopold's sore point, and also his strong one as far as argument goes. It does add a distinct piment to travelling, to go round the churches with a person who chooses to regard them all as hostages, grabbed from one side by another side, returned under treaty by that side, destroyed, rebuilt, and returned again according as dynasties flourished or fell all over the world. And in the deplorable main, the hostages have remained in the hands of the unbelievers. Yes, you took it from us, is the phrase most often on Joseph Leopold's tongue, as my respectful so-called Protestant feet paddle along after the staid Dua Sacristan, treading on sacred flags that lead to the despoiled altar and to the arch over which the figure on the rood once bowed. And indeed, as far as the Elizabethan Kirche is concerned, it is a shabby story for Protz to hear. The two tall towers of St. Elizabeth's don't look a day older to me than, say, one of the colleges that, on the backs at Cambridge, brood over the smug, sullen waters with such a smart Tennysonian air of ancient peace. It is the kind of stone used in both German and English buildings which gives my ignorance that impression and the fact that this is a living church, and one way or another has been steadily kept in repair. It does not look old enough to have been the scene, was it not the scene, of everybody's great picture, pictures mostly by R.A.'s, of which reproductions glare from over the mantelpiece of every inn parlour in England. One masterpiece greeted me on my return from Marburg, swelling proudly on the walls of the Tate Gallery, Fresh from services in the Elizabethan Kirche, I stood and looked at the decorous nude figure kneeling before the order of the chapel, while the stern priest, her confessor, stands behind her with a scourge in his hand. Daily he bruised and flagellated his royal penitent, and the people of Marburg were more scandalised than edified. Conrad of Marburg, the Dominican monk who had contrived to get possession of the body and soul of the Princess of Hungary, seems to me a thoroughly Irving-esque figure. Yet the great man never impersonated him. The story is curious and touching, compounded as it is of dim religious superstition and poetry. 
as the landgrave of thuringia sat in his castle of the wartburg among his minnesingers there came to him a renowned poet and magician klingsor von hunderland the magician announced to the landgrave that that very night a child should be born the destined consort of his son louis her mother was gertrud von meren the sister of st hedwig and her father was king andreas of hungary and this child was to be a saint like her aunt the landgrave lost no time but sent messengers to demand the baby's hand in marriage for his son and the daughter of the king of hungary which shows what important and powerful people the german landgraves were was instantly rendered up and carried in a silver cradle to the wartburg where she was brought up with her prospective bridegroom and in due course became his wife she gave him an ordinary unsaintly man a great deal of trouble the priest who domineered over her all her days and who procured her saintship began his teaching early he made her a fanatic like himself she gave all she had to the poor and when her husband objected she managed to prosecute her charities in secret and the supernatural powers connived we all know the story of the loaves of bread that she was carrying in her apron when surprised by her husband and how they were transmogrified as he peered to see and convict her of charity into flowers but as one chronicler says quote, she bestowed her arms without distinction so when the tide of her fortunes turned and she was reduced to begging for bread for herself and her child at eisenach she was rudely entreated nay thrown down in the mud by one of the very beggars she had benefited in her proud time while the power of the dominican monk lasted she was supreme he was secretly supported by the pope and usurping the office of heretical judge arraigned citizens and petty nobility before his tribunal it was not until he made an attack on the high nobility in the person of the count von Zorms that that important personage rebelled went to the diet at mayence proved his innocence of the charges brought against him and demanded reparation for his insulted honour one of the archbishops he of treves spoke for him the king granted him what he asked and gave over the monk to popular vengeance elizabeth was dead and not even her sanctity could save him but what power had been his through the queenly woman he had terrorized joseph leopold would not like me to say this but on the other hand i do not like to think of the midnight scourgings and the want of taste shown by the catholic victim she exhibited the wounds she had allowed conrad to inflict upon her body saying proudly behold the caresses of my confessor is not that speech in its simple serious raillery typical of the whole social mind of the middle ages but joseph leopold doesn't think st elizabeth a silly woman at all and he finds it quite natural that the benefited beggar woman should turn and throw her benefactress into the mud that to him seems perfectly natural he has no high opinion of human nature but wants to do all he can for it but to do good without respect of persons has always seemed to me a useless philanthropy joseph leopold has it against me that in the old days of the growler driven by the sour man in many capes i was twice summoned in one week for the extra sixpence I have always contended that the second summons was a put-up job, and that two cabmen had laid their heads together for when the distance was measured, in the one case I was found to be strictly within my rights. I paid both claims. One summons was to be attended on Boxing Day, when I was away, and the other in a distant court at Camberwell. Rated by a friend for my over-strict interpretation of the proper fare, why not pay the poor beggar the extra sixpence makes him happy i replied with the insouciance of youth it's all very well but i didn't come into the world to make cabmen happy 
St. Elizabeth evidently did, as regards cabmen and their like, and great was her fame. There stand the two tall towers of her church to bear testimony to her scourgings, her fortitudes, her bitterness, and the nullity of her rewards on this earth. But no one thinks of the landgrave and his domestic happiness, destroyed because his wife preferred the sanguinary caresses of her confessor to his. No one worries about him, but her shrine is beautiful and was gorgeous, and her church was worth the robbing by Protestants. It is whitewashed now inside, and all the mural paintings are obscured, but there are one or two fine triptychs representing her. And finally, having drunk the Protestant cup of bitterness to the dregs at Joseph Leopold's hands, we took a landau and prepared to mount to the top to see a famous piece of paper, the very piece of parchment that set loose this scourge of Protestantism on a Catholic world, Luther's protest. We creaked up, it took us a good hour, from the Elizabethan Kirche to the Platz, or Castle Garden, a level platform next to the Schloss. Two or three feet looking guns were planted in telling enquanios, set in little stunted wild currant bushes. This used to be the garden of the castle, where the lords thereof could walk abroad as we did and stretch their legs, and survey the river Lahn many feet below winding like a silver ribbon alongside the railway line, a jet black one, nearly parallel. At least, that is what we saw, and for the rest the view must have been much the same. I was exhausted as one who has mounted a mountain by the aid of a rack and pinion railway, and the clumsy old-fashioned Landau waited for us, and we found a custodian, and he rattled the customary keys and looked as if he disliked being disturbed. He led us into the large Rittersaal with the painted ceiling, with the immense fireplace and the wide window seats cut into the thickness of the wall. The usual suits of armour, made presumably for dwarfs, were standing about. We went through this hall up a flight of stone stairs and were ushered into a large room above, fitted with glass cases containing sheets of parchment written in crabbed characters, the handwriting used in Shakespeare's three authentic signatures, which are actually written in German characters, and with great fat seals as big, nay, in some cases bigger than themselves, depending from them by unpleasant-looking strings. These bullae represent the papal bulls, that used to puzzle the child mind so much in the pages of Mrs. Markham. There they are, many and many of them, small bits of discoloured parchment that were once received by kings and princes, and meant ruin to them in theirs often enough. It is prots, at any rate, who have done away with that. And there I came into collision with the views of Joseph Leopold again, and for the next five minutes went modestly hither and thither saying nothing, but peeping into this case and that case, and listening to his instruction. I saw the original of the famous sign manual of Charlemagne, the four-forked cross like the top of the hilt of a medieval sword that used to hold my childish eyes ever on the lookout for the concrete image at the top of one of Mrs. Markham's vivacious chapters. How ineffably childish my interest, compounded more of association than knowledge, must have seemed to the student who had ferreted out his facts for himself in many hours of patient poring over originals. And then there came suddenly the unpretending signature of Martin Luther and the warrant that gave Protestantism to the world. Even Joseph Leopold, whose historical interest goes side by side with his religious fervour, could not resist pointing out to me the brave up-and-down strokes of Luther, Zwingli, Martin Busser, and the rest of the men who lit this candle, by whose beams we in England walked at least a little way. When I was a child, I was made to read aloud in the evenings out of a tiny Elsevier volume, the first volume of Robertson's History of Charles V, 
and in the daytime I was also going through my first term at a high school. One morning towards the end of term time, we were set to write an original composition in one hour from starting, a sufficient task for a schoolgirl of ten or eleven. Our subject was the life of a hero, any hero. And on the spur of the moment, and the terrible clock hanging just over my head, I chose for my hero Martin Luther. It was because I had the night before read as far as the lively scene of Luther's interposition with regard to the selling of indulgences by the villainous Friar Tetzel. These are, of course, Robertson's characterizations. This was as far as I had gone in the volume. After scribbling away with a full pen for three quarters of an hour, I had nothing more to write about. I knew no more about Luther. So, after I had nibbled my pen frantically for twenty minutes, the clock face frightened me and I closed a very minute and detailed account of the reformer's earliest years up to the Tetzel incident with this sentence. A mirth-provoking family heirloom. Luther was never brought to justice, but died on his bed. This schoolgirl ineptitude ought not to have occurred to me in this connection, nor surely ought I to have fondly related it to Joseph Leopold, or at any rate not within these walls. He was walking about in a state of ecstasy, becoming rather to his calling of historical novelist than to his severe religious views. There, he was saying to his mother, there, that is what I have brought you to see the protest of Zwingli, Luther and Bucer. That bit of paper is Protestantism. It all began with the signing of that bit of paper. And turning to me, that is what you mean when you say you are a Protestant. But I don't say it, I remarked helplessly, as so many times before. I even deny it. Useless. A prot I am and seemingly must remain so in the eyes of this black papist. End of section 12